wonderful to see uh, all of you here this evening, especially the young people from all over Luzon. Um, I was uh, uh, thinking as I was sitting here that uh, when I was a child, as you know, I was born in the Philippines, born in Cebu City. I was thinking that in those early days, there was almost no work in Luzon. Uh, the first place that I saw with the ministry was the Bicol region, and I was able to visit there. There were one or two missionaries who worked in that area, and I was able to visit there as a child. But uh, when in the Manila area, uh, the area of Flag, uh, when I went to high school in Antipolo, there were no Grace Churches in Manila. And uh, to think of how the ministry has grown from those early days when there were, I think, 20 churches when I was a child, um, up to uh, where we are today where we can fill a big room like this, I almost think that uh, the pandemic maybe uh, has increased the attendance, right? Uh, I think the, all the conferences I've attended have been running about 50% more attendance than was expected, was planned for. And I think people are tired of being locked down in their houses, and they want to get out and meet other people, right? They're tired of looking at people on their TV screens, right, uh, the Zoom meetings. I tell you, I grew really tired of Zoom meetings during uh, the pandemic, uh, and actually sit next to a real human being, right? And uh, get to know someone maybe you've never had the chance to meet before. And so it's wonderful you've all made the effort to be here. I know some of you traveled for many hours. I heard maybe some are still on the way. And uh, thank you for making that journey. I pray this conference is a great blessing for you. Um, especially we're thinking spiritually, but maybe also emotionally, uh, physically, um, and uh, who knows, uh, socially. I saw the word socially up here on the screen. Uh, maybe socially it will be a real blessing for you as well. Um, I wanted to look at the theme of our conference again. Uh, the verse is actually uh, 2 Timothy 2, 22. And I'll read it in the King James Version first, if you're familiar with that in your church. And then I'll read it in the NIV, which I'll be speaking from. Uh, KJV, flee also youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And then in the NIV it reads like this. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Um, so my message, I'm going to use that. I believe strongly in the concept of themes. And I try to center my messages on the theme when I'm asked to speak. I believe the organizers of this conference spent time praying about this conference. And they discussed the theme. They probably had several ideas. And they decided on this theme. And if you can read it here, I think you've already read it. Hot seat. Confronting church controversies. Right? And they've taken it from this passage about... Uh, fleeing the evil desires of youth. And in fact, that's the, my message today is called Flee the Evil Desires of Youth. I just want to say, uh, as I start, I, I have three children. Um, of course, they're adults now. I have uh, 11 grandchildren. And I do have a concern for young people growing up and growing up to love the Lord, growing up to stand for Jesus Christ in their generation. Um, as I talk to my kids, as I talk to my grandkids, they are faced with many serious issues at a young age. Uh, my grandchildren are not yet teenagers. I think the oldest are twins, uh, 10 years old. Uh, and yet they're already facing some of these issues. Uh, Pastor Baldwin mentioned uh, evolutionary ideas. They've already been faced with that at the age of 10 years old the concept of evolution, that we're just here by, by random chance. We're, nobody had any plan for us to be here, and nobody has a plan for us in the future. That's evolution. And so I know that you as young people, um, teenagers and in your early 20s, you are faced with all of these issues. And the question is, do you have an answer when someone attacks your faith? And people will attack your faith. 
Um, whether you like it or not, it might be a teacher, it might be a co-student, it might be a co-worker in the job. Um, somebody is going to attack the beliefs that you have. Are you ready to stand for Jesus Christ? Are you ready to stand for the truth? You know, when I was young, uh, growing up in the Philippines, I, uh, we did not face many of the issues that you do. Uh, we did not have the internet. Okay? We did not have social media. Um, life, in a sense, life was maybe simpler or slower than you, you. You are facing life like a race car, you know, constantly information coming into you at any moment. Your phone is beeping with something new that you have to deal with. And uh, it's confusing at times. Um, and I think it can be emotionally stressful to have uh, all that uh, information coming into you. On the, I used to enjoy the airplanes. I fly a lot because of my job as international director of TCM. But on the plane, I, could, I knew oh, there's no internet access on the plane, so I can just relax. Well, that's all changing now, right? Because more and more planes are getting internet access. So you're getting text messages and emails uh, while you're flying on the airplane. Uh, but you young people, uh, you're facing issues at a younger age than I ever had to face uh, when I was your age. And I think it's important to us for us to talk openly about it. When I was young, there were certain subjects you never mentioned. Even parents wouldn't mention those things to their kids. I mean, that was just, you know, taboo. You don't do that. Um, and in the church, there are certain words you would never mention uh, in public. Um, I remember when we had our uh, sex education classes. Okay? The boys would go into one room and the girls in another room. And you'd both be watching the exact same film. And uh, then uh, they would, uh, the whip girls would talk to a woman and the boys to a man and so forth. And that was about it as far as sex education. Uh, because nobody else wanted to mention those things in public. And yet today you're faced with that. I sometimes listen to uh, like rap music, the secular rap music. And, I, and if I can understand the words, which is only half the time, I'm thinking, wow, are you allowed to say that in public? I mean, they're talking about sexual things with uh, killing people and, and uh, terrible language. And it's like, wow, young people face this all the time. And I think it's important for you to know, where do you stand? Who are you? What is your belief? What, what is true? What is false? And I think even at your age, you need to deal with these things. So I'm very thankful for this conference, for willing to bring these, uh, these concepts to light. And you will be discussing them. Probably most of you have already faced these concepts in your lives. And I'm thankful for all the lecturers uh, during your class. I really pray you will learn something. And I pray you'll come out of this conference with a firm stand for Jesus Christ, that you will know what you believe, you'll be able to prove what you believe from the Bible, and it's going to guide you for the rest of your lives. So let's pray for a great conference. I think it's, who's going to be in the hot seat? I don't know. I think it's the lecturers, not me, because they've not given me these topics. So uh, I'm not in the hot seat, but I think your lecturers for the conference, they're the ones who are going to be in the hot seats because they're going to talk about all of these controversial issues that uh, you have to face. You know, in the church, I sometimes think of the church like a boat. Okay, a boat is supposed to float on top of the water and then there's people riding in the boat. So the people are like the members of the church. The boat is like the church. And the idea is the water is out of the boat, and in the boat is dry, right? And unfortunately, in some churches, uh, I think people are, are saying, oh, I like the water. So they're getting uh, buckets and dumping the water inside the church, right? And uh, sometimes uh, the church, uh, and I've been in some churches where it seems like the water has filled up the boat already. We're still sitting in the boat, but the water level in the boat is the same as the water level outside. And uh, probably you should just get out and swim back to the shore, right? Because that boat is sunk. And we don't want our churches to be this way. And uh, as we go through the generations, 
we don't want to accept the world as our source of truth. We want to accept the Bible and God as our source of truth. And so I think a conference like this helps us to make sure the water stays outside the boat and that the boat is dry. We know who we are, what we believe, and we can stand for what we believe. And so uh, I titled my message, Flee the Evil Desires of Youth. Uh, my first point is this, flee from temptation. That word desires is actually has a negative connotation, sort of like coveting, wanting what somebody else has. Um, you see a friend and he's doing that, so I want to do that also. Um, and it has kind of a negative connotation. So I just use the word temptations. Flee from your temptations. Um, Paul is not saying that the youth are evil. I want that to be clear. Uh, sometimes we read that passage and say, oh, you, youth are evil or youth have evil desires. We all have a body of flesh. We can all be tempted to sin. It does not matter your age. Okay, but Paul is specifically talking to a young man named Timothy. And Timothy had unique temptations, unique desires that maybe Paul, Paul was an old man by this time. He says the time of my departure has come in chapter 4. Uh, so the temptations and the desires that Paul had would have been different from the temptations and desires that young Timothy had. We don't know the age of Timothy, but we can guess maybe he was around 20 years old. He is called a young man in, in the Bible. And so at that age of around 20, he had the unique uh, temptations that come with being that age. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, you know, temptations uh, can come to us, I believe, through two sources. One is through our body of flesh. Uh, we are all born with a body that can uh, have desires that are inappropriate. Uh, we know that sin affects our bodies. I mean, we get sick, for example. I think if there was no sin, none of us would ever be sick. Uh, older, uh, we, we know people who have died. And so, why is there death? Because the wages of sin is death. So we know that our bodies are influenced by sin. And in fact, our bodies are temporary on this earth. And our bodies can be attracted to certain types of sin. And so we know that just having a body of flesh can be a temptation. But also, we must think of spiritual warfare. Satan is alive. And there are evil spirits working together with Satan. We have to recognize that Satan hates God. Satan wants to destroy the church. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your life. Satan does not love anybody but himself. Satan is, uh, there's some people who call themselves Satanists, uh, and they try to worship Satan. But Satan loves nobody but himself. The sin of Satan was pride. He put everybody else down, and he put himself up. It's not like Jesus. You know, we sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We say, love your enemies because Jesus loved his enemies. Uh, Jesus', Jesus love and Satan's love are totally different. And so Satan affects us. He comes into our lives, into our, uh, can come into us through many sources, the social media that we receive, friends that we have who talk to us, newspaper ads, movies we watch, music we listen to, and Satan has a way to try to come into our lives and tempt us and cause us to do things that will shame God. Satan doesn't care about you. You're just a tool to be used by Satan to fight against God. And if he can get you to believe his lies, then he has won a great victory against God and against our church. And so those are the two sources that we get of temptation. Um, I remember a, uh, uh, one of the big sources, I think for young people especially, is peer pressure. You know that term, peer pressure. Other um, people your age, they have certain clothes, they do certain activities, they have a certain uh, uh, definition of beauty or fun, 
And uh, then they try to convince you also that, yes, this is the way you should be living as well. And I think especially for young people, you want to fit in with them. You want to be accepted. And so peer pressure is very strong on you. I will tell you, as I get grown older, peer pressure makes less and less difference to me at my age. Um, I really, uh, I'm not going to say I don't care what people think because I do work with other people. And so in my, uh, the people I work with, I am concerned about what they think. But just some random people I meet and they say, what you're teaching is a lie. Like, well, you're welcome to your opinion, but I don't really care about your opinion because my truth comes from the Bible and from God. And so peer pressure, I think, is something that affects us less as we get older. But I know for you as young people, what your peers, other people your age, or in your school, uh, in your circle of friends, what they think of you is uh, life-changing, life-threatening. Um, it affects what you think about yourself, and you will change your behavior because of what others tell you. And so this is something that you have to be aware of and be, uh, be notice that, oh, I'm being affected by peer pressure because that person is, is doing something. I have to, I have this need to do it also. And you should be aware of that. You know, I told you I went to high school in Manila. I was in a boarding school. And I had a friend there, and um, I used to love playing basketball. And he played basketball too. And he was a good student. I enjoyed talking to him. Um, then one day, he wasn't there anymore. And I'm wondering, whoa, what happened to him? It was a boarding school, so I didn't know his parents, and I didn't know what happened. I heard something about drugs, like he got gotten involved in drugs. Uh, but he was just gone, and I didn't see him. About a year later, I was playing basketball. There was a basketball game at an international school in Manila, and I was playing for my school, Faith Academy. And he was, uh, I was just walking down the hall, you know, back hallway to look for the bathroom. And I walked down the hall and there he was walking towards me. I mean, this is a high school kid and he was walking like a, an old man, you know. No expression on his face. I came up to him, you know, and said, hi, you know, and he just sort of slowly lifted his head and just looked at me. His eyes were very dull. I tried to talk to him like, does this guy have a, is the brain left? I don't know, but he was just gone, mentally gone. I don't know if he had an overdose or, or what happened, but somehow he had been influenced by others. You know, in any uh, school, there's the, the druggies, as we used to call them, but those who push that kind of thing, and he had gotten involved with them, and it totally destroyed his life. He was a different person than he had been, and I think, man, he had such a bright future. He was a great guy, good-looking kid, basketball, good grades, and he just threw it all away, huh? threw it all away. And that's what my concern for you young people. You know, I'm, I'm 62, I just turned 62 this year. You know, my, I know my years remaining are less than the years that have passed. And I think of you, you have so many years ahead of you. You can change your generation. You can change your world. But the question is, will you stay on the path that will allow you to change the world? Or will you allow yourself to get sidetracked? Someone's pulling you this way. Someone else is pulling you that way. And pretty soon you take your eyes off your vision of what you could accomplish. And instead you're taking your second best, third best, or you're just throwing your life away. And so for you, this is a great conference for you, and I pray you'll make decisions that will guide you for the rest of your life. Um, be careful of those temptations. I wanted to just mention, I know this will be discussed in one of the seminars, uh, but I think uh, in our modern society, a lot of temptation comes through this, right? I think a lot of young people these days own one of these, and uh, a lot of communication comes through this. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. This is just a piece of electronics, right? Um, and yet, it can be used to bring good into your life, or it can be used to bring evil into your life. 
and it's upon you to choose which one you're going to allow into your life. Because there's something here that can destroy your life. I will tell you that. There's something here that can destroy your life. You will never be the same person again. And there's something here that can bless your life. You can learn. You can become greater than you were before by things you can learn from this. And so I think we have to be really careful of the technology that is available to us. I remember an African pastor told me one time, he says, Ben, you must control technology. Do not let technology control you. Right? And so many of us are controlled by our technology. Um, I remember in the old days, an African, uh, uh, you know, missionaries, especially American missionaries, we run everything by the clock, right? Everything had to be on time. And in Africa, it's like, you know, what's the problem? I mean, we're here, we're having a great time, we're talking, we're singing. What difference does it make what time it is, right? And uh, the Africans would always joke, the American missionaries, they, they wear their God on their wrist, right? They wear their God on their wrist because when the clock says, you know, 12, the service is over. Bye, I'm going home, right? The relationship is finished now because it's 12 o'clock. My God has spoken. Um, and uh, now, of course, we know that in a modern society with many people, we have to run according to time. And which reminds me, what time is it? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Say, oh, this guy's from Africa, he's not going to stop, huh? So, um, but, no, really, I mean, we say that, you know, our clocks, uh, our watches used to control our time, but now often we run our lives by what this tells us, our fears, our excitement, our passion. It all comes from some message we got on our cell phones, right? And uh, I think we have to be wise. We have to judge carefully. Uh, there's good here. There's also evil here, uh, just like there is in, in a city. I don't know what city you lived in. I, I went to high school in Manila, and I know very well there were evil places I could go in Manila. And I know there were also many good places I could go in Manila, right? And it's the same on the internet. There's good places that will help your life, and there's evil places that are going to destroy your life. And you have the choice of where you're going to go where your fingers and your mind is going to lead you on the internet. Um, the, uh, uh, when I think of uh, some of the desires of, of young people, um, I was just thinking of some of the things that might be desires. It says flee the evil desires, but there are some desires that are not evil, but if they're not pursued properly, they could become evil. For example, desire for romance and maybe leading to marriage. That's a good thing, right? God created marriage. God created male and female. I think you're going to discuss that concept of male and female in uh, one of your sessions. Um, but that's the way God created us. It's written in the Word of God. And that desire to someday have a lifetime partner and spread, spend the rest of your life with that person that is a natural desire. That's a good desire. That's something that God built into us. God said, build the earth with people, right? And uh, that comes through marriage, which God has ordained. And yet, in that desire for a relationship with something else, someone else, we can get sidetracked, right? We can stop following the rules of God in the Bible. And we can start making our own rules. And we can say, well, this is okay. My friend is doing it, so it's okay if I do it also. And uh, we start getting uh, off of God's perfect plan. Um, I, by the way, I, I'm all for uh, conferences like this, and I hope maybe some of you are thinking of uh, um, a marriage. And... Uh, if you meet your future spouse at this conference, wonderful. What a great place to meet your future spouse than a LGYC, right? Yeah. And that would be fantastic. Um, that started some conversations, huh? 
I'll tell you, I, I met my wife. My wife's name is Joyce. I met her. I was uh, going to a church, a Grace Church, and it was a Sunday uh, evening service, and I was preparing to go to Africa as a missionary. And so I'm giving my presentation, and I noticed this uh, beautiful lady sitting there in the audience, and uh, I was single, and uh, I'm uh, trying to give my presentation of Africa and also keep my mind on her, and uh, I think that was a, a very confusing presentation of Africa. Huh? Um, but afterwards, uh, we met each other, and uh, actually we met in February, engaged in June, married in August, and we got to Africa in November, all of the same year. You know? My, my uh, philosophy is, if you found the right one, why wait? Huh? <laughs> and uh, here, here we are, uh, what, 37 years later, uh, Joyce and I have been married 37 years, and we are happy, we're serving the Lord together, we have three children, 11 grandchildren. Amen. Yes, but in, in my romance with Joyce, we followed the principles of the Bible. Um, we, um, I chose someone based on how the Bible says we should choose someone. I asked other people about my wife, uh, my, not my wife, my girlfriend at that time, uh, but I asked others about her. Who is she? What does she do? Where, where does she go to church? Um, and something interesting, my wife had been a short-term missionary right here in Baguio City. She was here, I think, uh, six months maybe, yeah. And she worked here. I did not know her at the time. We had never met. But just on her own, she had wanted to serve the Lord in short-term mission. And that impressed me, right? On her own, she'd raised the money, she'd come to the Philippines, and she'd worked here in Baguio for six months. And so... Uh, her interest in mission, my interest in mission. We both love the grace message. And uh, so we joined together in marriage. And uh, it is a blessing. But I will tell you, I've also seen marriages that were, you know, like a curse, right? It's just constant fighting, constant problems. And uh, many times it's because the principles of God were not followed in that relationship. I remember many years ago in... I was a missionary there. There was a young lady named Mary, and she used to be a Bible woman, and she used to translate for us, help us in our ministry with Joyce. And she knew the Bible. She knew about being, do not be unequally yoked, which means a believer marrying an unbeliever. And um, uh, then one day she just disappeared. We didn't see her. And we heard the story that she had married a Muslim. Now, of course, Muslims do not believe Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And so there was immediate conflict between them. She liked to sing songs. She liked to read the Bible. And about, I didn't see her for a long time. And then her parents were in a grace church. I was preaching in the grace church. She was there. And afterwards, she talked to me for don't know, 20, 30 minutes, and she had tears running down her face as she told me of all the problems that she had had in her marriage. Her husband forbid her from singing Christian songs in the house. One day her husband took her Bible and threw it right out the window of the house, um, and she was crying about her life and the life she was facing. But the fact is she knew God's will before she entered into that relationship. People had told her. She had even taught verses of the Bible that, and she broke those rules of God in the Bible. And she was crying because of the life that she was living. And so I encourage you, um, as you look for romance and marriage, follow biblical principles. And I know in the meetings tomorrow you're going to be discussing more of biblical principles of choosing a partner in life. And I pray that you all choose uh, wisely. Choose wisely, huh? I think another thing that people have is a desire for identity. 
Uh, these days we talk a lot about identity, right? And people are trying to identify as something else than they are. Um, and uh, we all want to belong somewhere. Who do I belong to? What group am I a part of? I want to be part of this group over here. So I need to change my life so I'm like them. And uh, those, I, we all want to identify. Uh, we're all here with the uh, Luzon Grace Youth Conference, so we've identified with uh, the Luzon Grace Youth. Um, but you know there's other groups out there that would like you to identify with them. And you have to be very careful. Is this a godly identity? Or is this a humanistic identity? Or is this an evil identity? Because those are all there welcoming you, asking you to be part of their group. And so I think that this desire for identity, this desire for belonging to someone, it can lead people to make uh, poor decisions in their lives. Um, you are created in the image of God. That's your primary identity. God created you. He loves you. He created you male or female, just the two. And uh, he has a plan and a purpose for you. So your main identity is in the image of God. Now, if you have ever trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are identified in Christ. The Holy Spirit has baptized you into Christ. So you are identified with Jesus Christ. And if you have a local church, I notice they're calling, you know, Big Four and Flag and Norlag. You are identified with those groups as well. And so we all seek an identity, but we need to be wise about who we identify with. And I think this is something that especially young people are trying to figure out. Who am I? Where do I belong? What group is my group? Uh, and uh, those are questions that you're trying to figure out at this point in your life. And I pray that you will choose wisely. Another one is uh, we might be, I think there's a lot of focus on physical identity, right? Our looks. Uh, what are good looks? How do we define good looks? You know? And um, I think that that can lead people down a path also that is dangerous. You know, I always think when you're choosing a spouse, don't choose just by the, you know, the outward appearance, right? As they say in English, uh, uh, it's skin deep, right? Beauty can be skin deep. We look for the true beauty of a person on the inside. Um, the person who, you know, whatever they look like physically, what is in their heart? Do they have real love? Are they ready to sacrifice themselves for you? Do they care about you? When you're sick in the hospital, is this the person you want to come and sit beside you and talk to you and hold your hand and help you through that hard time? Um, you're not going to be looking at them. You're just going to be hearing them. Um, is this the person whose heart shines through uh, their whatever they look like physically? And um, I think this is some causes a lot of... Uh, 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 temptations and evil desires also among youth when we just base everything just on the immediate physical appearance. And so those are just a few. I know your teachers will talk about more. But as I was thinking about being young myself uh, at one time and then looking at uh, my own kids and uh, grandkids, these are some that I had come up with. Now what is the other thing? I think when we flee from one temptation, we should flee toward something else. And this is what the Apostle Paul uh, says here. He says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue, okay, run away from something and run toward something else. Pursue uh, righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, I'm not going to talk about peace tonight. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but I want to talk about righteousness, faith, and love. Um, righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. One of my uh, favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. True righteousness comes from God, and it comes through Jesus Christ. 
You see, uh, Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he had no sin. Jesus Christ was without sin. Um, you know, and he, he chose that time when he was going to die for our sins. The wages of sin is death. Jesus was willing to take his sins, our sins on himself and die for us. Um, you know, there was another time they tried to crucify Jesus uh, in his hometown of Nazareth. They tried to grab him and throw him off the cliff, right? Well, the wages of sin is death, and Jesus had no sin at that time. So they could not kill him. It said he just walked through them because it was not his time to die, and he had no sin on him, so he could not die. But when he went to the cross of Calvary, after being beaten and whipped and crowned of thorns, carrying that heavy cross through the streets, um, he was nailed to that cross, and they set him up there. And at that moment, God took our sins, all of us, all the evil and wicked things you and I have done and will do, um, and not just us, but everyone in the whole world, all sins, all people, all time, and they were put to the account of Jesus Christ. And this is the time... Uh, uh, Jesus became sin. It says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin. That's Jesus Christ who became sin for us. And so while he was hanging on that cross, already suffering so much physically, and now uh, our sins were on him. A man who had been pure was suddenly responsible for the sins of the whole world. And in fact, that's the time Jesus shouted, to his father because his father had to turn away from his son because the father in heaven was pure the father in heaven was perfect the father in heaven had no sin but the son had taken sin willingly on himself and so he cried out to his father my God my God why have you forsaken me and you know why the father had to forsake the son because the son had become sin for us. Not his sin. Our sin was put to his account. And so the father had to turn away from his son because his son had become sinful. It had become something evil, something wicked. And the wages of sin is death. And Jesus died on that cross. And then before he died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. This is what I was called to do on the earth. And I obeyed my father. And I have completed the task. And now I will die for the sins of the people of this world. It is finished. And Jesus died. Now, praise the Lord, that's not the end of the story, right? What happened three days later? He was alive. I, I used to show the Jesus film in Kenya. Africa where I was a missionary. Many times I showed it. And I always liked that place. I showed it in Swahili and when Jesus came back to life they'd say, Yesu you high, Yesu you high. Jesus is alive. Right? What does that mean that Jesus is alive? He had overcome our sin. He had overcome death. And the fact that Jesus is alive means we can resurrect after we die also. Jesus was the first, and we can follow in his footsteps if we belong to Jesus Christ, if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Today, salvation is by grace through faith. Okay? God's grace was revealed 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary. Christ died for us. And today, when you hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin, and you have a choice. You can believe or you can reject. Okay? If you want that grace to be effective in your life, you can believe in Jesus Christ and your faith joins the grace of God. And when those two join together, we say that is reconciliation. You are reconciled to God. You are saved. You become the family of God. And I pray that all of you have responded in faith to Jesus Christ. Don't let this conference pass if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ. So when we pursue righteousness, we pursue it today through Jesus Christ.
We need God's righteousness. Our own righteousness cannot save us. Um, uh, third thing I want to say is this. Stand firm in your faith. We all need to trust someone. Who do you trust? What is your faith? What is your belief? Are you resolute? Do you stand strong even when problems come? Or are you wishy-washy, right? Here today, gone tomorrow, right? I've known many people like that in my ministry. I come one year and visit. I come three years later and say, oh, where's that guy who used to be here? He used to be a pastor. Oh, well, sorry. He, uh, he went somewhere else, okay? No, I, I hate to hear stories like that. If you believe something, stand for it. Apostle Paul says that. Stand firm, right? Uh, you know the passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Um, let me just find it here. Uh, quickly, First Corinthians 15, 58. Uh, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And there Paul urges us to stand firm. Let nothing move you. And there will always be other people trying to push you. Go this way, go that way, go the other way. If you know the truth, stand firm for it. Don't let yourself be moved. And finally, Paul talks about, uh, tells Timothy, love, to use love. Love one another. You know, in the English language, there's a short word, love. And uh, sometimes it's confused with another four-letter English word beginning with L. That word is lust, okay? Do not confuse love and lust. Uh, in love, for example, what is love? Uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that what did he do? He gave his only begotten son. Is there something more precious than an only begotten son? I don't know, because I don't have any sons, only daughters. But uh, no, that, uh, in that culture, that was the most precious thing, was an only begotten son. And God gave the most precious thing to us. Why? Because of love. Love means you give. Love is a decision of the will. I love you and I will give and I will help you and it, I will sacrifice for you. That's love. What's lust? Huh? Lust is you sacrifice for me, right? For my enjoyment, you sacrifice yourself. That's lust. That's all about myself and enjoying myself. So don't confuse those two English words, right? Love and lust. And sometimes in English, we, we confuse them. I hear people say, I love pizza. Really? Huh? I mean, love pizza. Okay. Uh, we all know what it means, of course. But actually, you lust for pizza. Huh? And maybe we all have lust for pizza. I don't know. But uh, I love pizza. Love, actually, in the Bible is a very strong word. And it has the idea of sacrificing for somebody else, for the good of somebody else. And Paul tells Timothy to pursue love. And we should love one another. Uh, John says this, and we know, uh, 1 John 4, 16, and we know and rely on the love of God, the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. In God in them. And so, God and love are connected together. God is love. It doesn't mean love is God. But God is love, and if we are in God, then we also will live a life of love. Uh, probably the greatest passage on love is 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. You hear that? It does not dishonor others, right? Um, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, when you read this, if you're in God and you are to love like God loves you, you can put your own name in here. I'll just choose a generic name, John. 
sorry if your name is John, but I'm going to use you tonight. Uh, but let me just, but you put your name, you put your name here, okay? Instead of the word love, you put your own name. I'm just going to use John, okay? So John is patient. John is kind. John does not envy. John does not boast. John is not proud. John does not dishonor others. John is not self-seeking. John is not easily angered. John keeps no record of wrongs. John does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. John always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Does that describe your life? That's the way Paul wanted Timothy to live his life. And I think that's the way we should be living our lives also. This should be a description of our life. If we're really pursuing love, if we're fleeing the evil desires of youth and pursuing true love, not lust, we're pursuing true love, we will live like this. And so, in conclusion, just a review. My points were these. Flee from temptations. And uh, the temptations you have might be different than the temptations of the person next to you. Flee from your temptations. Pursue righteousness. That's in Jesus Christ. Stand firm in your faith. Know what you believe and stand on what you believe. And fourthly, I said love. The Bible says love one another. Pursue love. Um, I just want to talk about this concept of fleeing temptation. When I was in high school in Manila, um, I, uh, uh, I had some friends who were not godly people, let me say that. I lived in a boarding school, so my parents were in Indonesia, and I was somewhat free to make uh, many of my own decisions. And I had uh, a couple of friends who were not godly people. And uh, I lived in a dorm at Faith Academy, a Christian school. My parents were, my dorm parents were Christians. Um, but I would go sometimes down to the city and stay with my friend. And my friend uh, was a uh, temptation to me, I have to say. He, uh, uh, I, if I, get, I will not go into details of everything, but uh, I mean, he would even steal his parents' car so that we could go out partying. And uh, he, uh, um, and so, you know, many things I won't go into all the details, but I remember coming back one night from one of those party parties, 3 a.m. I was on a mattress on the floor beside his bed and just lying there, and all of a sudden it's like everything became black. Um, and you know, in Manila, it's never dark because there's always light in the sky, and all of a sudden everything was just black. I mean, dark. I had my eyes open, I'm looking at the window, uh, there was not one source of light anywhere. It was almost like a black cotton or something. And it was all black. And it's almost like God at that point, I was a junior in high school, uh, my, uh, the, the Lord speaking to me and saying, Ben, it's very dark where you're going. And I will not go with you there. And I remember those words clearly. And I realized, you know, I have to make some changes in my life. I've gone very far from the truth in my lifestyle. And, um, you know, I knew I could not fight directly. I knew if I stayed in the school, the temptation would still be there. And the next week I wrote to my parents and I says, I do not want to go to this school for my senior year. I will finish my correspondence and I will go directly to college. And uh, I wrote to them, they said, okay, we will find a school for you to finish high school. They were living in Indonesia, so I went and lived with them. Uh, but I finished my junior year, did my senior year there, went to college. Um, but notice, I had to flee from the temptation, right? Uh, sometimes we think, I am a spiritual giant. I have memorized a hundred verses. Nothing can tempt me. Don't deceive yourself, my friend. Satan can tempt you. He knows very well how to tempt you. And there are times you just have to get out of that temptation. Flee away from it. Find a way where you can't be tempted by that thing. And that is often the wisest choice. Rather than to think you're a giant, you're going to fight it. I encourage you to flee from that. And that's what Apostle Paul said. Flee from it. 
I got out of that school, um, and that way, I mean, there were many good people in the school. I, I, there were Christian people, but there were also people who were an evil influence on me. And so by leaving the school, I got out from under that influence. I rededicated my life to the Lord, and I went to college, and uh, I have had a good life, right? I've had a good life because I made that decision to flee from temptation before that temptation destroyed me, right? And I'm very thankful for God to give me a warning. Ben, you know, he's tapping me on my shoulder. Ben, be careful. You're going to a very bad place. Do not go there, okay? So thank you. Thank you for listening. Let me close my message in prayer. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we know you love us. We know you sent your Son to die on 